He sees everything? Part 1. Childhood in a gloomy house. My name is Diana, and my life began in a small Ukrainian village. My father left my mother and me right after I was born. My mother, Natalia, was a strong woman who did everything she could to provide me with a happy childhood, despite all the difficulties. We lived in an old house outside the city that my mother inherited from her grandmother. The house was large, two-storied, with numerous rooms. But due to time and lack of repairs, it seemed gloomy and neglected. In the attic stood an old painting, a portrait of the previous owner of the house, a man with cold eyes and a stern face. The painting hung above the fireplace, and it seemed that the eyes of this man followed everyone who entered the room. This gaze pierced to the bone and left a feeling of discomfort. We lived with a cat, a black and fluffy one named Mirko. Mirko was a strange creature. He constantly reacted to something invisible to the human eye. The cat often sat and stared into the dark corners of the rooms, sometimes hissing or running away with a loud meow. My mother said that the cat sensed the presence of something from another world. I loved my cat, but his behavior scared me. One night, when I was about eight years old, I woke up to his loud hissing. Moko was sitting on the bed and staring into a dark corner of the room. His eyes glowed in the dark, and his fur stood on end. I listened, and it seemed to me that I heard a faint rustling, as if someone or something was moving across the floor. I tried to calm the cat, but he kept hissing and staring into the corner. My heart was pounding harder, and I was ready to run to my mother's room when I suddenly felt a cold breath on my neck. I turned around, but there was no one behind me. That night, I couldn't fall asleep, and this episode left a deep mark of fear within me. Part 2. The Beginning of the Horrors After that night when Mirko scared me with his hissing, real horrors began to occur in our house. Every evening, as twilight descended on the house, I started to feel strange things. Footsteps in the attic became almost routine, even though no one was there. Doors and windows began to open and close by themselves, creating a constant feeling of someone's invisible presence. This feeling reminded me of the eyes from the painting, which seemed alive and followed my every move. My mother tried to reassure me, saying it was just the wind, but I saw fear in her eyes. She often prayed before bed and placed a glass of water by the bed at night, an old ritual from her grandmother to ward off evil spirits. She also carried a small silver cross, which was considered a talisman against evil. One evening, when I was nine years old, my mother went to town on errands and left me home alone. She said she would be back late, so I decided to spend my time reading a book. But around nine o'clock, I heard the attic door creak and close. My heart froze. I approached the door and listened. It was quiet behind it. But suddenly, the door began to open slowly. Summoning all my courage, I took a flashlight and went up to the attic. The attic was cool and dark. My flashlight illuminated old furniture, boxes of junk, and that same painting. The man's eyes in the painting seemed even colder and more terrifying. 
I walked around the attic but found nothing suspicious. Just as I was about to leave, I heard a quiet whisper behind me. I turned around but saw no one. My hand trembled and the flashlight fell. In the darkness, I heard someone or something approaching me. I grabbed the flashlight and ran down the stairs, closing the door behind me. This incident marked the beginning of a series of dreadful events. From then on, I often heard strange sounds, footsteps, whispers, even laughter. Sometimes I would wake up at night feeling a cold breath on me. Once, I even saw a shadow on the wall moving by itself. I screamed, and my mother came to comfort me, but I could see she was frightened too. Part 3. Spirits of the Past Days went by, and I tried not to pay attention to the strange events. My mother also didn't talk about them, trying to make our lives as normal as possible. But it was clear that the house was changing. I noticed things often disappearing from one place and reappearing in another. The lights could flicker on their own, and sometimes I heard voices when I was alone in a room. One day, during another attempt to find something interesting in the attic, I found an old diary. It was hidden in an old dusty chest. The diary belonged to the previous owner of the house, the same man from the painting named Alexander. Opening the diary, I immerse myself in the world of the past. From the pages of the diary, I learned that Alexander was a local doctor who lived here many years ago. He was obsessed with the idea of immortality and conducted numerous experiments trying to find a way to prolong life. Alexander believed that his soul could live forever if he remained in the house. The diary contained descriptions of his experiments, records of unusual phenomena he observed, and even drawings and diagrams of strange devices. The more I read, the more terrifying it became. Alexander wrote about the feeling of otherworldly presence, about visions and voices he heard. He believed he had found a way to leave his soul in the house and that his spirit could live forever. The diary ended with a note about his last experiment, after which no one saw him alive anymore. People said he died under mysterious circumstances. His body was found in the same room where the painting now hung. Discovering this diary only intensified my fear. I was convinced that Alexander's spirit still lingered in the house and that he was causing all these strange occurrences. Cold dread enveloped me as I realized that perhaps all these strange events were Alexander's attempts to communicate with me or even possess my body. I decided to tell my mother about the diary. She listened to me attentively, but I could see it was hard for her to believe. She reassured me, saying it was all just imagination and that the diary might have been written by someone with a mental disorder. But even after her words, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something supernatural was happening in our house. My mother tried to maintain a normal rhythm of life. We went to school, did household chores, spent time together. But the strange events didn't stop. One evening, while we were having dinner, the lights in the kitchen suddenly went out. We were left in darkness, hearing only each other's breathing. Suddenly, I heard a whisper coming from right behind me. I turned around but saw no one. My mother grabbed my hand and we ran out of the kitchen. These events continued until they reached their climax. 
One time, I woke up to Mirko hissing loudly and running around the room. His eyes were glowing in the dark, and he was staring at something invisible to me. I heard whispers coming from the walls and felt a cold breath on my neck. It was unbearable. I felt like I was losing my mind. Part 4. Culmination of Horror continued. Soon, due to the constant tension in the house, my mother became ill and she became worse and worse. I had to call the doctors. They took my mother to the hospital and told me to stay in the house. That night was the last straw. I couldn't stay in that house for another minute. Doctors and neighbors tried to reassure me, but I felt like we weren't alone in that house. I was convinced that Alexander's spirit was involved in all these events. After they took my mother away, I was left alone. Sitting on the stairs, I felt the fear creeping deeper into me. Darkness enveloped the house, and the silence was so loud that it felt deafening. Mirko sat beside me, softly purring, as if he too sensed the horror. I decided that I had to leave this house forever. I knew that if I stayed here, I would simply lose my mind. I quickly gathered my things, the essentials, a few changes of clothes, my mother's photographs and Alexander's diary. It was hard for me to leave everything else behind, but fear overpowered all other emotions. Leaving the house, I went to the nearest neighbors. They were surprised and somewhat frightened by my appearance, but they understood the seriousness of the situation and immediately offered their help. I stayed with them for the night. But even there, I couldn't calm down. I constantly felt like Alexander's spirit was watching me, as if he wanted to drag me back into his house again. Part 5. Escape and a fresh start. In a week, the doctors told me that my mother had died. Her heart could not take it. The next day, I called my grandmother, who lived in another city. She came for me within a few hours. Seeing me, she immediately understood that something terrible had happened. I told her about my mother's death and the strange events in the house. She didn't ask many questions, just hugged me tightly and promised that everything would be okay. Life at my grandmother's was calmer. She lived in a small apartment in the city where there was no place for ghosts and horrors of the past. But I still couldn't forget those dreadful nights in the old house. Nightmares haunted me, reliving those horrifying moments over and over again. I often woke up screaming, and my grandmother would come to comfort me, trying to distract me from bad thoughts. My school years passed in a haze. I tried to find peace, but constantly felt like something unseen was still watching me. Nightmares about the house and Alexander haunted me. My grandmother did everything she could to bring me back to normal life. We often went for walks, visited museums and cinemas, but I could never fully distract myself. Part 6. Returning to Normal Life with time, I began to feel a bit better. I started socializing more with peers, found new friends, and even got into sports. It helped me distract myself from the terrifying memories, but sometimes the nightmare still returned. I decided that the only way to finally rid myself of these fears was to understand what really happened in that house. One day, I decided to return to the old house, but not alone, with friends. They supported me and agreed to help unravel the mystery. We arrived at the house and went inside. The house was empty and dilapidated, 
but it seemed like it was waiting for our return. We searched the house, found remnants of old belongings and Alexander's notes. We realized that he had indeed conducted his experiments, trying to communicate with another world. But his experiments led to his spirit remaining in the house, bringing with it fear and terror. My friends helped me understand that I no longer had to be afraid. We gathered all the records and destroyed them so that no one else could use this knowledge. I felt like I could finally rid myself of the fears that had plagued me for so many years. Part 7. A New Life After our visit to the house, I felt like I could finally leave the past behind. Nightmares became rare, and I started living a full life. I enrolled in university, found a job, and made new acquaintances. The past no longer had power over me, but sometimes, when I'm alone in the evenings, I feel like I hear a quiet whisper, as if from the distant past. I understand that it's just my imagination, but the memory of those terrifying days will always stay with me. It's a reminder that evil can be near, even when we don't see it. However, I've learned to live with these memories, and I'm no longer afraid. I know that I have the strength and support of loved ones to overcome any difficulties. And although the old house remains a part of my past, I won't let it influence my future anymore. This story has taught me to cherish life and the people around me. I've realized that even the scariest moments can be overcome if we don't give up and believe in our abilities. And although the spirits of the past sometimes make themselves known, I know that real life is here and now, and I'm ready to embrace it with an open heart. Thank you.